Welcome back. I'm Lauren Hardin, co-chair of PTAC, and very excited to welcome you to this session where we've invited four experts who have real world experience in innovative approaches to facilitate value-based transformation in rural environments. Um, at this time, I'd like to ask our pre presenters to go ahead and turn on your videos if you haven't. All four, after all four have presented, our committee members will have plenty of time to ask questions. The full biographies of our panelists can be found on the ASPE PTAC website, along with other materials for today's meeting. So I'll briefly introduce our guests. First, we have Dr. David Herman, who is Chief Executive Officer at Essentia Health. Welcome back, David. Please go ahead. Thank you very, very much. And I really appreciate PTAC having these sessions. Uh, I learn a lot more than I'm sure that the content that I provide that others are learning from me. There's a, as you can see, there's a great body of knowledge and a lot of committed people that want this to work. Next slide, please. Just a little bit of background at Essentia Health. Our mission is we are called to make a healthy difference in people's lives. And I think you'll note from that, it's not about whether they're in our clinics or in our hospitals, but it also includes the communities. There's the resources that we have. I do recognize that we are likely more resource rich than a lot of smaller practices, yet our commitment is to rural health. Next slide, please. What I'd like to share today is that we've been on a value-based care journey uh, since 2016 in our organization. What I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the things you've already heard a lot of detail on, the unique challenges of providing care in the rural communities then how we embarked on that value-based care, what we've learned along the way, and then most importantly, how these models serve as a pathway for the future of rural health care and gaining better health outcomes for the rural communities that we're all privileged to serve. Next slide, please. You've heard ad infinitum about the rural health care challenges. This is our service area in Minnesota, and I'm gonna show some other slides that back this up. Lower household incomes much older, less education, certainly more health concerns. The distance to care, particularly in Northern Minnesota, is very, very great. And these communities and the people that reside within these communities are relatively resource poor. There are many food deserts. There's unreliable, if existing, broadband connectivity. The provider practices that exist in these rural communities are smaller, and there certainly is a lack of specialty services either within the community or within an hour's drive away. Next slide, please. As you can see in this, Brown is significantly below the median state income for the state of Minnesota. And as you can see that small town rural and isolated rural, the area that we're privileged to serve, certainly has its disproportionate share of those below the median state income. Next slide, please. Health insurance is another thing that many of our communities and our patients struggle with. As you can see, a large proportion of Minnesota patients in rural areas are on Medicare, Medical Assistance, Minnesota Care, or other supported programs. And I can tell you that when you look at employer-sponsored plans and it says rural there at 39.4%, we at Essentia Health are right around 23% on that. As to outline the chair, the challenges with that, Minnesota has not rebased its Medicaid compensation since 2017. And the world that we live in, particularly since 2020, has had significant inflation in everything that we use to serve these patients. Next slide, please. Travel to care, significantly different. 85 minutes for mental health. Uh, 38 minutes on average for maternity and neonatal care. Other med surgical care, 60 minutes. So it is a long ways away. Telehealth certainly helps, can provide and close some of those gaps, but still when a person needs to travel, particularly when they're aged, it's not just them that needs to get in the car, but generally their son and their daughter. The opportunity costs as well as the time and travel costs are tremendous. Next slide, please. So really what it took for us to get started on this was an organizational commitment to the work. We decided in 2016 is that if we were gonna be taking the care of the communities that we're privileged to care for, we had to focus on the quality of their care and their outcomes 
rather than just on the volume of the care that we provided. In order to do that well, we had to have an emphasis on prevention and wellness because the distances are so far. Keeping someone healthy within their community is of great benefit to the patients and the communities. In order to make sure that we're doing well with our patients, coordination and integration of care is tremendously important. Showing up at the wrong clinic at the wrong time after a two and a half hour drive is not serving our patients well. Also, I don't know if any of you have tried to navigate the healthcare system within the last several years, but even for the best of us, even when we're feeling well, it's incredibly complex and confusing. In order to do this, we had to transform our organization. We couldn't just remodel it around the edges, and that transformation had to be clinician driven. And I'm very proud of my colleagues that have helped navigate our way through that. Next slide, please. So our approach, and what I did is I had my colleagues put pictures of some of our buildings in there to remind me that this is not about the buildings. This is not about capital spend for patients to go. This is about how we care for our patients on a day-to-day -day basis. The first thing we needed to do was identify the patients, not just the ones that are, quote, attributed to us, but everyone in the communities were privileged to serve. Then we needed to determine what their care needs were, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. We need to manage their chronic illnesses and provide their care needs in a proactive and coordinated way. One of the things we think about is that everybody should have a mother or a grandmother that you can call when you have a health question and get pragmatic advice that you can use on a moment's notice. We want the utilization to be appropriate. That also drives lower health care spending. There's also tremendous health related social factors within our communities, things that we can do on a day to day basis in partnership with community partners that can really make a difference in the health outcomes of the people we're privileged to serve. And then we want to be a bridge organization and provide partnerships with government, private payers, and the community organizations to make sure that we're being good stewards, not just of essential health funds, but the funds in the community and the funds that are provided to us by government and other entities. Next slide, please. We first started with community level priorities. Every hospital does a community health needs assessment and implementation plan, but what do you do after you do that? We've decided that in order to make progress, we need to strategically invest in community projects, whether that's dollars or expertise, depends upon the project. We need to be fully engaged in these community coalitions. They have resources and knowledge that we do not have as a healthcare organization. And then sometimes it takes an organization to kick, get these things kick-started. And what we want to be able to do is implement and then evaluate for success those strategies that have been defined within those implementation plans. And then work together to create community conditions, not just healthcare conditions, that empower all of us in our communities to realize our optimal health. Next slide, please. So our approach is what we call the three A's, analytics, then action, and accountability. And what we strive to do in each one of these communities is create a model of care delivery that is as standard as possible and yet as unique as necessary to meet the needs of our patients and communities. That infrastructure can certainly be common, but even communities that are as close as 20 miles apart often have very different and desperate needs to maintain health outcomes within their communities. Next slide, please. What we use our analytics for is first risk stratification. Who needs resources now and who needs them a little bit later? The evaluation of utilization patterns, which one of our patients aren't seeing us often enough or seeing us too often, but in the wrong ways. Through that, identify that care gap identification and design to close those. And then referral management, not just telling a patient you need to see a cardiologist, but to be able to cultivate that and curate that and get those patients and their care connected. Next slide, please. Then that comes to action. We need alternative care delivery models, such as virtual, virtual care, remote monitoring, home EMS services, improving those transitions of care to make sure that the patient does not fall through a care gap that we may have. Addressing those social factors that influence health and well being at home and within their community closing their care gaps, and then of course, chronic illness management. I'm proud to say that we're one of the best organizations in the country for 
lack of readmissions after an admission for congestive heart failure, as an example. And it's because of the system that we've built around the patient. Next slide, please. Accountability. We all know what we're responsible for, yet we hold ourselves accountable for that. We establish goals through our governance structure all the way up to the board. We provide oversight coaching on performance to make sure people are doing the things that they need to do and helping them redesign those care models literally on the fly. We have transparency. We share quality data across our organization. Any of our providers, if they want to know how they're doing on their quality, they can click it. If they want to know how anyone else in our organization is doing on our quality measures, they have access to that information very easily as well. We track that progress. And then we just don't wait till the end of the year or the end of the quarter. We have ongoing improvement strategies. If we're not meeting our goals, if we're not closing those gaps, what are we going to be doing differently tomorrow than we're doing today to be better as an organization to better serve our patients and communities? Next slide, please. All of it starts for us addressing the needs of our communities because that's where health starts. We want to, at the individual level, address immediate non-medical needs of a patient. Talk about that in just a second. That organizational part, develop those partnership to tackle those needs beyond the medical setting. And then in our community, collaborate with community members and local stakeholders to identify the needs and then close those gaps. There are skills that the communities have that we will never have as an organization that can lead to better health for the people we're privileged to serve. Next slide, please. One of the things we've used to address the needs of our community is each one of our primary care patients at each visit, because their status can change, complete a five question screening in my chart. Our community care associate then follows up with that, and then we make community referrals and partnerships to make sure that we can close those gaps, not just identify them. Next slide, please. Last year, we did 185,000 screenings. We identified 20,000 patients who identified at least one need. We have 10 community care associates who have worked with the patients. We made 12,000 referrals, and 20% of those patients with a social need are connected with a new resource at that time of the visit to help them maintain their wellness and their health. Next slide, please. We use a tool called Resourceful that's immediately available within our EPIC uh, EHR. Uh, we have then have a public site also where community members can access this as well to make those connections when our community partners find that they need a resource that they may not have. Next slide, please. As you can see on this map, we have 664 programs. It's a living thing, things roll in, things roll out and it works across our entire service area. Next slide, please. We have been very successful in Medicare shared savings and the Minnesota Integrated Health Partnership. You can see the numbers there. Nearly 40% of our revenue flows through value-based programs and about 80% of those value-based contracts have downside risk. We're willing to take upside and downside risk because that helps us drive our accountability through these programs. Next slide, please. The lessons that we've learned, first of all, commitment as an organization is crucial. We've heard a lot over the last 20 years about having one foot in the dock and one foot in the boat. I believe unless you jump right in the water and get wet and make a commitment, you really can't do this as an organization. It requires designed infrastructure to support it. Just asking our colleagues and clinicians to do better every day does not meet our patients' need. We need to know what our patients needs and the community needs, and then work together to close those gaps in care. I do, do believe that organizational strategies can be different, whether you're capacity limited versus demand limited as an organization. Our organization is capacity limited. So when someone says, what am I gonna do with my excess capacity when we take better care of patients? We do not have excess capacity. There's another person that needs to get in for our care that may be different than other organizations, particularly in very rural areas where they may be demand limited. And then building the systems within your organization and the partnerships with the communities that make the right thing to do the easiest thing to do. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. Look forward to the conversation.
Thank you so much, David, and thanks for returning again. Your presentation was very helpful. Next, I'd like to welcome Dr. Ami Bath, who is Chief Innovation Officer at the American College of Cardiology and an Associate Professor at Harvard Medical School. Um, please go ahead, Ami. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so I just wanted to echo a few things that David started with. I think the first is the organization's commitment to doing this work is really important. Um, and so I, I just want to start by saying at the American College of Cardiology, um, we have a value-based care forum where we really get together clinicians, but not siloed from all the other institutions that are relevant in making this happen. Um, and so I will refer you to an American Heart Association uh, journal uh, article, and I can maybe um, include that in the chat later for everybody to take a look at um, that came out that really puts together all of our thoughts about where we start from, what the key things to look at are, and where we might end up. Um, today, specifically, I've been asked to talk about interventions and models for um, value-based transformation in rural areas. And so, um, even though uh, a lot of the work can be echoed in that paper, I'm taking a slightly different take on it to help share with you. Next slide. Is it too loud in the background here, by the way? Are we okay? It's okay, okay. Um, I want to start with just two key things. When we talk about rural care for cardiovascular care, this is often what we see. Procedure rates are lower in rural hospitals, right? so the critical access hospitals. Um, here you see in the top chart, acute myocardial infarction or heart attacks in blue are rural hospitals, in red are urban hospitals, and we see decreased rates of cardiac catheterization, intervention or placement of stents, or coronary artery bypass grafting. And then similarly, we also see in stroke care, far decreased rates of systemic thrombolysis or endovascular therapy. Next slide. We also see mortality is higher in rural hospitals, and this is across the board, whether it's heart attack, heart failure, or ischemic stroke uh, in the top panel, or uh, acute MI, heart failure, and ischemic stroke is 90 days in the bottom panel. Next slide. The point I'd like to make today is I think we have to really differentiate chronic from acute care when we talk about how are we going to make progress in the initial stages of value-based models that include cardiovascular care. And for that, root cause is essential in improving critical access hospital outcomes. So similar to what David was saying, we need to move into the communities where these people live in order to be able to catch these diseases far earlier than we're currently catching them. And that's inherently the root of our problem in cardiovascular disease outcomes. It is possible, I'll only talk about this once and not again, to strengthen our telehealth and our transfer networks for the acute care between rural and non-rural hospitals, especially in stroke care. The use of telestroke care has been incredibly helpful in really changing our ability to, to medically treat stroke patients. However, for the purposes of this discussion, I think I want to concentrate on the other side, which is we do think about how will we provide more care. We have quite a workforce shortage in rural areas and cardiovascular across the board, but clearly in cardiovascular. And we often talk about whether we need to implement community-based or hospital-focused telehealth. And I'll say I think we need to meet, move even earlier than that because our quality improvement efforts that are centered on improving telehealth based out of the brick and mortar institution are still not as successful as we see with behavioral health and other fields where we're implementing home-based telecare. And so really preferences for staying close to home are clear. Our population of cardiovascular disease overlaps with a large majority of the mental health population. So in fact, those studies are studying our patients a large majority of the time. Um, lastly, I want to point out that Medicare Advantage does already demonstrate differences in preventive versus acute care when it comes to cardiovascular disease. Now, I recognize that Medicare Advantage versus the rest of Medicare may be a select population, but we are seeing that value-based efforts already are showing differences, both at 30, 90 days, but even at 365 days. Next slide. So how do we approach this? Um, I think one of the most important things is to build that rural cardiovascular care infrastructure. There's some excellent groups that are already working on this. The first is rural-oriented design. We are really focused at the ACC on expansion of the team. Um, I'm currently uh, in New York City for the UN General Assembly side meeting where we're talking about workforce shortage, and I only bring that up because 
our approach globally is really very similar to our approach when we think about rural underserved areas in the U.S., which is that team, yes, will include physicians. It can include um, allied practitioners, nurse practitioners, or physician assistants, but we have to lean on the LPNs. We have to lean on pharmacists, and oftentimes community health workers are really a key part of our answer to be able to, be able to provide care all the way down to the communities where people live, especially in rural areas. And so we're really committed to thinking about what does the expansion of the team look like? Also, what does payment for the expansion of the team look like, right? How does that change payment models is important. The second that we've focused on and our value-based care uh, forum that we had at the American College of Cardiology Heart House started with atrial fibrillation as a single diagnosis that we could then care for. We're not going to have single diagnosis in a single episode. We're actually saying it's a, over the life of a diagnosis, what happens to these patients. And from that, we're learning that disease-based closed-loop programs may actually be the way for us to be able to achieve value-based care. The other two areas this would be relevant in are heart failure and hypertension, times where we can help educate the community, we can diagnose earlier, we can then implement care in the communities where people live, and then take those patients when we realize that they need further care and get them to the right person at the right time. Um, there needs to be a unique blend of community-based care, telemedicine, and then larger practices. I think we have to recognize that we can't say it's going to be 20% telemedicine and 80% in-person and everybody's going to do that. And so I think a little bit of uh, loosening of the reins on this is the percentage we do in any given practice is important. I say that only because as we build practices, oftentimes we say, well, how much are you going to do this? And the answer is we really don't know. So we need the flexibility to know when we're going to be using telemedicine, when we're using digital health or remote monitoring for cardiovascular disease, and when we need people to be seen in person, either in the homes where they live um, or in uh, the local institution. One of the collaborations that we um, have had for the past several years is with a group called Dispatch Health. And that's been a great example for us of starting to learn about how to get to the communities, to patients' homes, and what kind of care can we provide there that the patients understand and feel safe and that we do as well. One of the key things that we really focus on is ensuring that by having cost-saving care or care in areas that may have less access to specific types of testing, although we're increasing what we can get to the home, we're not actually decreasing the quality of that care. And so really starting to think about what are the metrics and what is the balance between cost and quality. Um, it is an important part of our work um, and partnering with some of these organizations helps us study that. And then lastly, we really want high impact, low complexity digital health. You are hearing about, and I'm gonna bring it up, AI and chat GPT and clinical decision making. And the more complicated we get with the digital health interventions, uh, the harder it's going to be for us to be able to build the infrastructure upon which that could then grow. So we really are still focused on lower complexity digital health to reach the areas we need to reach to establish that infrastructure. At the same time, you'll hear our organization studying the more complex parts of AI and digital health. However, we can't think about starting with that first necessarily. I can answer more questions about that later. Next slide. So what are the advantages? There are a couple of advantages to cardiology um, in terms of uh, taking care of rural populations. So the first is we know that patient volume in rural health is lower in general. And this is the problem with the shutter hip hospitals um, is simply that we have lower volume. However, our cardiovascular risk factors and disease are quite prevalent. So you can really fairly say that if we're talking about doing population-based care together between subspecialties and primary care, Cardiovascular disease is going to overlap, overlap at least 60 to 80% of the time, depending on which age group you're looking at. So for us, that's a great opportunity to study together and not study cardiovascular separate from primary care. The second, we know we have human and finance resource limited. However, for cardiology, we're pretty good at remote monitoring services, and that's a great force multiplier. So if we really only have one physician to be able to look over an area, we can set up those remote monitoring systems and set up the alerts to get us the right care at the right time. Uh, we can actually force multiply the workforce that we currently have because remote monitoring is so well established in our field. Um, we have a way to link compensation. 
to non cost saving metrics as well. The last time I spoke with PTAC, I know that I brought this up as well, but achieving what we call guideline directed medical therapy for almost any cardiovascular disease. We have very clear algorithm and goals for these are the medications, these are the therapies that people should receive. We are also clearly not meeting that guideline directed medical therapy goal in the United States right now, especially in rural and actually inner city America as well. And so I think linking compensation to those non cost saving metrics of what part of the population achieves guideline directed medical therapy, because we know that guideline directed medical therapy will turn into um, better outcomes, morbidity and mortality. Um, could be a good near-term mechanism for us to start to test some of these infrastructures. And lastly, and I mentioned this earlier, we need to incentivize team-based care. Uh, and we need some innovative local community health roles. The, the more time we spend thinking about global, the more we think about how relevant what we're doing there is to rural America, um, and really thinking about who are the community health workers that we could upskill, educate, who may be providing primary care right now or urgent care right now, but could really help us provide cardiovascular care at the same time um, and create a novel mechanism of team-based care. Next slide. Um, this is my favorite digital health paradigm, rural health fits it perfectly. We have chronic management, which is the bulk of what cardiovascular disease is, and that partnership with primary care needs to happen. It's patient-centric. It reduces low-value specialist care, and when we have a workforce shortage, that's really important. It helps us identify rising risk in the community so that we can identify illness and then manage it either locally in their home, out of primary care, or coming to a specialty practice. Um, and it really does enable us to take those patients who require intervention that I started with on the first slide who are having worse outcomes and worse mortality in the critical access hospitals and instead be able to get them specialty care in the appropriate place where they belong. And some of those patients will do excellently at the critical access hospital and we can identify those who may not, but we can only do that if we're using digital health and we're measuring these patients earlier on. Next slide. Um, I'm going to end with the patients. Uh, what are we working on at the ACC? So we are really thinking about how do we take education, which is what the American College of Cardiology produces, and revise it to make it relevant to rural team caregivers and patients. Um, how do we do that? What does that look like? Partnering with others who are willing to do that with us. The second is accept the use of blended care and not be fixed in what that looks like. Use phone, use video in addition to being seen in person um, and accept that those, again, those ratios can change from day to day and that's okay. Um, realize our patient's potential by making digital interfaces easier to engage with for self-monitoring. We need to start thinking about the systems that allow self-monitoring and how we can really make those digital interfaces as easy as the rest of the digital world. But we can't say rural America doesn't have digital interaction. They in fact have quite a bit but the people who are interacting with them have entire fields and teams who are building how easy it is to use those interfaces and we're not doing that just yet in medicine and I think that's a, that's a priority for us in terms of innovation at the ACC. Um, we do need to match rural needs with the interventions that are offered. So I think um, what we refer to as heat mapping, which is which are the areas that have the ability to have good connectivity and have high hypertension. Those are the areas where remote blood pressure monitoring programs make sense. But if we have areas that don't have good connectivity, then we just can't do the square peg round hole. We should think about who the community-based health workers are and design differently for those areas. Um, so I think the one size fits all, we need to do even better than that. And then lastly, and this is a new area that we're working in, but I wanted to share with everybody, is to start to lead registries and trials. We, we do a lot of this in cardiology, but generally it comes from us. We have a registry, a clinician puts the data in, we run a trial, and rather using some of the novel registry mechanisms that are actually patients able to get onto a cell phone and sign up or get onto a web, again, requires some connectivity, but minimal, and sign up themselves to be part of a registry. And so the patient-led registries um, are an area we have great interest in because our patients are motivated. They want to care. 
and they're being built in a way that's already addressing that user interface that we're trying to think about and turning our clinical work to be something that is um, with a good user interface for the patient. Instead, these registries are really being created as, hey, patients, go ahead and sign up for this. What happens next? When a patient signs up, they give permission for us to be able to then extract their digital health records from the EHR, whether it's a local one or a large conglomerate, and then be able to, to help analyze that data, set up remote monitoring systems for them. And so having patient registries, and I would say, you know, it's hard to say rural patient registry, that's a very large and amorphous idea, but are there specific disease processes where we want to really be able to engage patients to enroll themselves? And then their clinicians will come along and be on board um, as well. So I think that's a really interesting area and happy to talk more about that later. I think that might be my last slide. Okay. Thank you so much. And apologies again for the background noise. Thank you so much, Ami. That was very interesting. Next, we'd like to welcome Thad Skunkweiler, who is an associate professor at the Department of Health Science and director of the Center for Rural Behavioral Health at the College of Allied Health and Nursing at Minnesota State University, Mankato. Welcome, Thad. Please go ahead. Good morning. Thank you, everyone, for having me join this, uh, this webinar today to share a little bit about my uh, professional expertise and honestly, my personal passion. Um, I'm a bit of an odd outlier, uh, given some of the topics we've had so far in that my presentation is, is exclusively focused on behavioral health um, and really about the workforce. And I think it is important that, to have that conversation because it, it doesn't matter how you pay for care um, if, there are, if there's no one to provide the care is, is how I've always have framed that conversation. And so I just want to spend about 10 minutes to talk about some of the challenges and opportunities and, and how we're going to move forward in solving some of these. Uh, issues within rural behavioral health. Next slide. Now, all of us are aware there are multitudes of challenges going on across healthcare in various uh, capacities, but none that is getting the attention that mental and health and behavioral health is having. Um, you know, the attention that our media is focusing in on some of these issues, as well as some of our decision makers and policy makers at the states and federal levels, they are, they are zeroing in on what's going on with people, and rightfully so. People are unwell. We are, we are seeing rates of, of mental unwellness and emotional distress that we historically have never seen before. And so these challenges are very real and impact every facet of what we do, whether we're a CEO of an entire system or a cardiologist. I mean, all of us are impacted professionally and, and many of us personally by these challenges. The story that's often missed when we're having these conversations is about the treatment gap. And what I mean by that is there are more people who need services than the providers who can provide it. And so we kind of refer to this as the treatment gap. Next slide. The challenge with that treatment gap among many is that it's not geographically equitable. Um, the rural the rural America uh, has a, a, a huge gap of behavioral health services. Um, and this, this graphic here uh, kind of really outlines it's from HRSA. It's the health professional shortage areas for mental health. And everywhere that it's dark uh, is, a, is a HIPSA for mental health. And so you can see pretty much the entire country uh, other than the highly concentrated metropolitan areas qualifies as a mental health professional shortage area. In Minnesota, where I'm from, 80% uh, of our counties qualify as a, uh, as a HIPSA. South Dakota, our neighbors to the west, 100% of their counties are mental health professional shortage areas. So this issue, this treatment gap that we talk about, it's, it's important to recognize that it is, it is impacting our rural communities at a, a much higher rate than our, our metropolitan counterparts. Next slide. Oh, one more, I think. I think we skipped over a couple. Okay. Uh, oh, the, the, never mind. There we, we got it right here. Um, the issue, as a professor, we're always kind of uh, couched as being the doom and gloom folks, and I'm going to be a little bit doom and gloom before we get to some of our opportunities. Um, this problem is getting worse. Um, we are seeing unprecedented increasing demand for behavioral health services. For those of you in the room who are providers, you're probably seeing this come across your desk. Here in Minnesota, our state association just did a, a survey of the community uh, mental health clinics, and we have 7,000 children on waiting lists in Minnesota for mental health services, and it's not getting any better. All the underlying metrics show us that uh, things are getting worse as far as uh, people's emotional well-being. 
On top of that, we're seeing an unprecedented provider exodus from behavioral health care, in part due to retirements. I think the profession on its own, particularly in rural communities, our providers tend to be a little bit older. In Minnesota, for example, over half of our behavioral health professionals in Minnesota are 55 years of age or older. Um, and that's a problem because we're not graduating students going into these programs at the rate in which people are retiring, uh, simply just to reaching that age. The other, the other issue that is facing healthcare across the board, but is really impacting behavioral health is burnout and folks who are leaving their careers or reducing their hours worked or going to a cash only payment structure to reduce some of the administrative burden. We're seeing a lot of our providers burning out and, and leaving the field or reducing their capacity to treat patients. And so those two things combined just really kind of highlight just how I mean, we're in a crisis and it's going to get considerably worse if we if we don't act. Next slide. Now, HRSA would have us believe that we're going to have everything that we need in the next three years. Uh, this is the infamous uh, 2020 projection report uh, that told us that we would have two social workers for every job here uh, by 2030. And, and I can tell you um, that's the furthest thing from the truth uh, on the ground and what's going on. I mean, there are substantial vacancy rates across healthcare, but mental health care often has the highest, at least in Minnesota, uh, one out of every four uh, positions in Minnesota is vacant, according to uh, Department of Economic Development uh, data. So the HRSA projections are wrong. And the other thing they didn't take into account is the next slide. One of the conversations we're also not having, we're thinking about the future of the workforce is where is the pipeline going to come from? Uh, a well-known issue within higher education and but less known everywhere else is that we are about to fall off an enrollment cliff, uh, that there are going to be fewer high school graduates across this country uh, going into college. That's not taking into account economic factors and other factors that may dissuade someone from obtaining higher education. This is simply there are not enough kids graduating uh, high school that'll be eligible. So when we think about the future pipeline, we are gonna have to do more with even less. Next slide. So I, I, I like to give just a couple of uh, solutions uh, to some of the issues that, was, that were raised by the UGAO's um, report to Congress about the behavioral health workforce. And so if you have not read that report, basically Congress asked them to say, what are the barriers to growing the behavioral health workforce? And so they really looked at both the recruitment and retention side of things. And, and I won't go through each of these bullet points individually, but um, a couple of things that I think that are important to highlight when we're thinking about workforce. One is obviously the financial commitment that students make to get an advanced degree, whether that be a, a master's degree or a doctoral degree or in medicine, a, a medical degree. And we have great uh, student loan repayment programs, uh, National Health Service Corps, uh, state level programs. And, and I, what we have found through our work at, at the Center for Rural Behavioral Health is that we should really take that model and flip it over. And we should really invest in grants and scholarships on the front end to incentivize and recruit more people into this profession. It doesn't cost us as taxpayers anymore. It's just taking that repayment plan and putting it on the front end. The other piece around the academic pipeline issues, it's important for us to recruit uh, for rural health care in general. The, the literature is very clear. Um, if you want a health care workforce in rural communities, you have to grow it yourself. The transplant model uh, is ineffective. Uh, it doesn't work at the same rate that if you were to invest in growing that pipeline organically in those communities, um, that is shown that is shown to work. In addition to that, we have to increase the training capacity of our rural institutions. Research is very clear. Students tend to practice, at least within behavioral health, within a kind of geographical uh, catchment area of where they trained. And so how do we increase the training capacities of our programming? In Minnesota, we wrote a paper this spring for our legislature that they asked us, why don't we have more behavioral health professionals? And what we found through our work was that in Minnesota, we turn away 100 qualified students every year who want to pursue an advanced degree in behavioral health because of training capacity limitations. So at a time when we're having unprecedented demand for services and workforce shortages, how are we turning away kids who want to do this um, and are qualified to do it, but we just don't have the seats in our courses for them? So how do we solve some of those challenges? Next slide. 
And with retaining, I think, you know, the great work that you're all doing around reimbursement rates, alternative payment models, those things, uh, that work has to continue. I think it's the oldest story within mental health is that we're not paid enough, which is true. Um, but, you know, how are we going to innovate and, and, and solve some of those challenges uh, around that? The last piece about uh, burnout, right? Some of the exodus of our providers to burnout. It's, I think it's important for us as a industry to shift from a self-care model to a system care model. Stop putting the, the responsibility on the individual. I mean, they own some of that, but ultimately as a system, how are we going to uh, uh, attack this burnout issue uh, more holistically across the board? Next slide. We can go ahead. Oh, oh go back. A couple more. One more. Thank you. Uh, oh, now we'll go ahead. When we think about the, we'll go to the uh, slide that says opportunities, uh, data-driven policy solutions. I think it's two slides from this forward, please. There we go. Uh, so how do we how do we solve this issue? I think it's important for us to lean on the data. I think when we talk about mental health, there's a lot of personal feelings. There's a lot of emotion when it comes to it. We should really let the data uh, drive the conversation and how we solve this, particularly when it comes to things like policy. And so how do we enact policy that builds workforce capacity, both for the professionals, the licensed providers like myself, but also our paraprofessional colleagues? How do we increase their roles? And how do we, as, as uh, Ami talked about, pay for those uh, individuals to, to be part of that? care team, um, expand APMs that improve access to care, uh, prioritize upstream intervention. I think I just want to share just one piece about what I mean by that. There's a phenomenon I'm having across the country, and it happens in, in your settings, I'm sure, is that our EDs are full of people with mental health challenges and nowhere else to go. In Minnesota, it's a, it's a crisis, of, particularly with our young people, our children and adolescents, who are sitting in emergency departments sometimes for days, weeks, and, and in some cases, months before they can go uh, and receive appropriate care. When the legislature talks about how we solve this problem, their solution is build more hospital beds or open up more beds. And I think how silly, right? Like, why don't we go upstream and prevent them from having to walk into the doors of the EDs in the first place? We have 7,000 kids on a waiting list. Some of those kids aren't going to get care. Many of those kids won't get care. And they are going to end up in the EDs because we are not upstream intervening on some of those challenges. And the last piece I think is important um, is prevention. Uh, the best treatment is always uh, preventing it, and we don't often think about mental health prevention and building resilience and how do we uh, kind of adopt a model, a system, how do we pay for that to really incentivize some of those preventative practices so that we don't need the the, the demand in which we're seeing, because we will never out-supply this uh, and, and dig ourselves out of this hole. Next slide. The last thing I just want to highlight is uh, some of the great work that we're doing here in Southern Minnesota on this issue. Uh, the Center for Rural Behavioral Health is an academic research center that is is trying to solve this issue for Minnesota and, frankly, a, across this country. We're one of the we're one of the few academic research centers uh, in the United States that is exclusively focused on rural behavioral health. Um, and we're hoping that what we're learning uh, from our from our faculty and our research team can really hopefully solve some of the challenges that we have spent the last few minutes discussing. So. Thank you so much for having me, and I, I look forward to the question and answer se uh, series. Thank you so much, Thad. That was very interesting. And lastly, we have Dr. Susan Stone, who's president of Frontier Nursing University. Thank you. Uh, welcome, Susan, and please go ahead. And we can't hear your sound. Okay, sorry. Uh, just a little bit more about myself. I spent the first half of my career working in rural areas in upstate New York, Little Falls, New York, Herkimer, New York, Cooperstown, New York, and then later moved on to Kentucky, um, where I developed a faculty practice in southeastern Kentucky at a tiny rural hospital with Frontier Nursing Service. Um, in listening to the other presentations today, it's very inspiring and hopeful um, that we can make some differences in um, rural health care. I did, when we talk about prevention, I wanted to share a uh, little story that somebody told me just last week that has been kind of stuck in my brain. Picture a river and there's healthcare providers and EMTs and everybody standing around the river and there's babies coming down the river. 
and everybody's pulling the babies out and doing resuscitation and doing all kinds of healthcare with them. When somebody looks up and says, hey, maybe we better go upstream and find out who's throwing the babies in the river in the first place. And I think that's what we really have to think about when we're talking about social determinants of health. What are we doing upstream to cause this, these uh, significant problems that we're having? So next slide, please. So with the social determinants of health, you know, you all know, I've heard it today and yesterday too, when I signed into a couple of presentations, but they're the conditions where in the environments where people are born, live, learn, work, play, worship, and age that affect a wide range of health functioning and quality of life outcomes and risks. So rural persons, as you know, we've heard that today, uh, David Herman was very eloquent in de uh, delineating this, um, but they include poverty, lack of literacy, including health literacy, access to safe and affordable transportation, access to safe homes, environmental health, such as water quality, access to healthy and affordable food, and access to health care services. Um, we're at our wits end over this data on maternal deaths with all the work that we've been doing. The CDC reports that maternal deaths nearly doubled over the last three years. So our maternal mortality rate rising in rural communities where maternal mortality is almost double what it is in urban areas really struggle to access life-saving maternal health care. And this is a good example of the, the struggles. Next slide. So we're going to go quickly through these slides, but just you can see are in um, the rural areas, people are older. Next. People are more likely not to have a high school education. Next. People are more likely to have to report four or more chronic conditions in a rural area. Next. And they're more likely to use the emergency department um, for their visits and indicating a lack of primary health care providers. Next slide. They're poorer. They have less income to deal with every year. Next slide. Okay. So I love this, um, this diagram put out by the CDC. Social determinants of health are a really complex issue, and it's going to take all of our resources to really address them. Healthcare providers cannot uh, address all of these uh, issues. It, it's a team approach, but it does take policy and laws. We have to per, uh, we have to be collecting data and surveillance, and then we have to evaluate that data. We have to find out what strategies work and what don't work. We have to build our evidence. Partnerships are absolutely critical in order to solve some of our rural health issues. And we have to involve the communities because we cannot create uh, solutions for communities without involving them in what are their issues and, and what are we doing. The infrastructure and capacity, we've heard about that, not having internet, not, I mean, just think about saying, okay, now we're all going to use electronic medical records in a tiny, tiny critical access hospital with very few resources, uh, in, you know, IT resources, things like that. Um, these kinds of things are a struggle. How are we helping to make that happen? And one of our most important issues is equity. We have to pay attention to equity. We know that there's biases in our healthcare system. We can absolutely see that in the outcomes. Again, I report, uh, refer back to maternal mortality, where uh, women of color are three times more likely to die of childbirth and related issues than a white woman is in our country. So this is a very complex issue. Uh, I like this diagram. I think I'm going to put it on my desk so I remind myself every day that we have to look at everything. Next slide, please. So the you know, there's different kinds of rural areas. The Census Bureau said if it's not urban, it's rural. And the National Rural Health Association basically says, while we have to have definitions specific to the purposes of the programs for the programs that are being used, and um, these are referred to as programmatic designations. But the bottom line is really that not all rural areas or communities have the same challenges. Um, it's important to do a community assessment to identify the major issues when designing programs for rural communities. When I worked in Herkimer, New York, they're honestly a little bit similar to Hyden, Kentucky in many ways. But 
At the other hand, the resources were different. We could drive an hour and be in Albany or drive an hour the other way and be in Syracuse, where down in Haydn, it was more than two and a half hours to the uh, university setting um, health healthcare system. So um, even the mountains in Haydn were a challenge because uh, they would not do helicopter transfers unless um, the weather was perfect. They had too many bad outcomes. Um, you know, we actually had two helicopter crashes with very bad results. So you can just see like the, the, even though they're similar, they're very different and the challenges can be very different. And we have to pay attention to that. Next slide. So how are we currently addressing some of these? There's lots of programs like the comprehensive asthma as home assessments and education. Some federally qualified um, health centers even provide legal assistance to, you know, to help with housing and immigration and financial security. Um, it's important. I think that David did mention this too. I was very impressed with your presentation, David. <laughs> and I said, yeah. So, uh, but creating web-based systems that identify community resources and the referrals that are made to those resources and the outcomes of the referrals. If we could do that electronically, it would help so much. Um, offering telehealth services when appropriate uh, is very helpful in a rural setting and hiring community health workers. This is a very important issue. You know, if we can't go in and do the home visits ourselves and be out there in the community, we have to have community health workers that are out there assisting with patient contacts, education, facilitating partnerships, making those referrals happen. And uh, I think that we need to invest in a lot more community health workers to assist us in our work. Next slide. So promising models that improve outcomes. Again, technology systems that allow healthcare providers to screen for social needs and identify resources in those communities. If the resources are there, that's another issue. Connecting these systems to the medical record would allow tracking of outcomes and better coordination. And this is so important because, you know, just telling someone they need to go to WIC is just isn't enough. Um, this would also help us to determine what works. And it's really important for us to grow the evidence of what works. The Medicare Shades Shared Savings Program Pathways to Success does allow the organization of accountable care organizations. And the outcomes to date have shown comparable or better outcomes with decreased costs with the ACO compared to the traditional physician fee-for-service practices. And I'll talk about that more in a minute. But partnering with doulas also um, to give information and support to pregnant women, recruiting nurse midwives to provide first, uh, provide first line comprehensive maternity care that does address the social determinants of health. And in our university, um, which is a kind of unique university, we only educate advanced practice nurses and nurse midwives, um, family nurse practitioners, psychiatric mental health nurse practitioners, women's health care nurse practitioners. It is done through distance. We've been doing this for 30 years now. And so our students come to campus only twice during their educational program and spend some days with us. It's very interactive um, education though online. And um, we are recruiting from rural and underserved areas. 22% of our students do live in rural areas right now and over 60% live in rural and underserved areas overall. So we are educating these nurses to be nurse practitioners and nurse midwives to stay in their communities and work in their communities. We use community, we use their community as a classroom. So they have to learn more about the community, what the resources are, um, you know, what the needs are in that community. And we have evidence to show one, they have very high board pass rates. I know people are suspicious about distance education, but I promise you it works with 30 years of evidence to show it. They do stay and largely stay in their communities. And our a report from employers are that they're ready to practice when they hit the ground. So this is a way of getting more providers, um, nurse practitioners and nurse midwives, at least, and I'm sure it would work for other types of clinicians um, to be able to stay in their community and become educated and serve their own community. Next, community concordant care. You've probably heard of racial concordant care. We know that racial concordant care improves outcomes. Well, community concordant care does too. 
it's important for us to put providers in the community who know the community are part of the community and know the challenges of those communities. When I used to work in Haydn and the National um, Health Service Corps would send uh, scholars, so they would pay for them to um, get rid of their student loans and then send us a graduate from Long Island to live in Haydn, Kentucky and provide care. They rarely lasted very long. It was very difficult for them to really understand that whole community and to live in a community with no, no movie theaters, no the restaurants are DQ, and um, you know the nearest mall is two hours away. So you know that is important too. Community concordant care, and we can do that also by having more um, doulas, more community health workers who really know the community can help help, help us to br make bridges. Next slide, please. So the hub and spoke model where lar larger hospitals partner with smaller hospitals um, that are at risk of closure is really a positive um, similar models in which hospitals either develop clinics in places where they're most needed and partner with existing clinics staffed by nurse practitioners and nurse midwives. These clinics can effectively bring primary health care closer to those who need it. So um, I mentioned the one in Texas because I read about it and it looked really good. I worked at the one in Bassett Healthcare and I worked at the one at Mary Breckenridge Hospital. Bassett Healthcare, pretty well resourced, 13 rural health clinics all run by nurse practitioners. The nurse midwives visited weekly to provide care to maternity patients in those areas. And then of course, if there was any medical issue that needed physician's attention, uh, they would come into the hospital. So. That worked really, really well, and it still works really well today. Um, in Mary Breckenridge, it was a little bit different, a tiny critical access hospital. Average daily census was about 17, and um, there were six rural health clinics. Uh, the faculty practice of nurse practitioners and nurse midwives ran the rural health clinics and also had a small maternity practice within the hospital. We had a physician who provided collaboration and care on an ongoing basis, and, and that physician spent time in the rural health clinic that was at the hospital, so could deal with uh, more high-risk cases and ca cases that needed uh, a physician's care and attention. Um, that really worked well, too. I think those types of uh, practices are really hopeful um, for rural hospitals, next, for rural communities. Next slide. So, in a uh, the Alternative mo payment model really helps tremendously. So when I worked in places where everybody got paid a salary and basically it didn't matter how many patients you saw. I mean, the physicians might get bonuses at the end of the year if they did extraordinary things and that was great. That was really great. Um, uh, but this can uh, allow providers to build a team to relax and not feel as if you have to see XX number of patients per hour. Fee for service can incentivize a provider to see more patients with a decrease in time spent with each patient. I remember sitting in meetings and watching them review how many patients and the business people would say, look at Dr. So-and-so saw 40 patients the other day, yay. But what can you really do when you're seeing 40 patients in a day? So um, I really do support um, alternative payment models and not fee for service models. Also, we had situations where uh, obstetricians felt they had to do the births because otherwise they would not get reimbursed if the nurse midwife did the birth. So those kinds of things happen uh, and should be thought about. If an APM is thoughtfully developed with provider input, the result can be a system that facilitates team-based care, innovations and methods to deliver health care, and collaboration with APRMs, PAs, and other health, allied health professionals. Next slide, please. Okay, it's important that when we're talking about quality of care and measuring the quality of care with rural patients, they're sicker. And so you have to be careful that you're not comparing things that are really due to one group of patients being sicker than another group of patients. Traditional risk assessments focus on medical complexity, such as is, as we see with the hierarchical condition category. We need to add the assessment of social risk factor adjustment. Socially, as, for example, we could measure differences in smoking, history of drug use, education, income, employment, social support, and community resources. Uh, 
we need to operationalize these social risk factor assessments so that it can compare clinician performance and patient outcomes that are attributable, attributable to differences in the quality of care. Said by Milbank, and I just think that's well said. Next slide. Okay, this is my last slide. Uh, so we have to think about the heterogeneity of rural areas, and this has particular implications for healthcare performance measurement. Variations in geography, population density, available healthcare services and other factors make modifications for different areas necessary. There's also the possibility of not having enough patients to have a valid result. You know, this was important too, we see in the, uh, for example, down in Hyden. So the nurse practitioner out in the rural health clinic might see 11 patients in a day. She is seen as less productive than um, it was a she then the physician who was working in the rural health clinic and had as many patients as he could see in the, in the hospital rural health clinic. But is it still important to do those 11 visits? And how many minutes do we need in a visit to provide care that includes the social determinants of health? Um, we can't do all five minute maternity visits where all you do is check the blood pressure, check the heart rate and say, how are you doing or measure the belly? We have to have some time if we're going to provide that the kind of care that addresses social determinants of health. So the National Quality Forum has developed a core set of rural re relevant measures. They did so in 2018 and updated it in 2022, um, which can be helpful in us um, addressing these issues. So in summary, um, rural, rural persons struggle more with the social determinants of health than our urban population. And this is clear in their healthcare outcomes. And it takes a variety of approaches to address these issues as de defined by the CDC in all of those things that we have to take into consideration. Not all rural communities have the same challenges, so programs have to have the flexibility in application to be effective. And we have to operationalize social risk factor assessment in order to measure what's working and what's not as we move forward in helping our rural health population be healthier. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Susan. At this time, we're gonna to turn to our committee members for questions. And as usual, if you have a question, please flip your name tag up, um, name tent up or raise your hand. And um, let's see who would like to start with questions. Larry. Thank you everybody for your great presentations. Um, my question is gonna be for David. I was very impressed with um, your passion for what you're doing there in rural Minnesota. Um, and you made the statement that 40, I think it was 40% of your revenue was coming from value-based uh, contracts. That's impressive. Um, so how does that filter down to your providers? If, if that's at the entity level, that's where the revenue is coming in. So how do you incentivize your providers, specifically your specialists? Well, that, that's a very good question. So we don't treat any of our patients differently than we do our value-based care patients. So we take the infrastructure that we have underneath that and provide it to everybody along the way. We are not, I think this gets to a point that I tried to make, is that we are not capacity constrained we are capacity constrained, not demand constrained. So if, if as an example, someone that doesn't need hip surgery, uh, the orthopedist, although they are paid by RVU, knows that if that patient doesn't need it, I can have that time for another patient that does need it. So that's one of those things where you're capacity constrained or demand constrained. So we are capacity constrained with that. We, do, we used to provide incentives for quality of care. Uh, it was the least happy thing that I've experienced in the organization. So what we did is we said, we're not paying for quality care anymore. What we're doing is we're designing standard work to make sure that quality care is delivered. Minnesota has the, what they call the Minnesota community measures where every healthcare system is measured on more than 20 different metrics. We are number one in the state because we've designed that standard work to make the right thing to do the easy thing to do. 
So we are very transparent. I can look at my measures, a colleague can look at his or her measures, and can look at my measures. And so we paid basically, some people are on salary, uh, some people are on productivity, but we measure the quality in everybody's practice and make the right thing to do, the easy thing to do. Our providers are busy enough, and that that's, this was one of the, there are you know very few silver linings to some of the clouds over rural healthcare, but being relatively understaffed by specialty means that someone isn't well incented to provide care that's not necessary. Let's get that care back to the primary care provider and let's reserve my high level specialty care for the patients that really need it. Jay, please go forward. So this is a, a combo question for both David and, and Amit. We know the leading cause of death is cardiovascular disease. And the greatest discrepancy in the death rates between urban and rural populations is cardiovascular disease, which is both due to chronic disease and acute events, which I mean, you just showed in terms of the mortality of acute events. You don't want to have your acute MI in a rural hospital without an interventional cardiologist. Let, let's cut to the chase. So, so how do you address that in balance in rural settings? You know, be, because it, it, a, a small community hospital cannot support an interventional based cardiologist. And quite frankly, you don't want to go to someone who's doing 10 stents a year. You want somebody who's doing 10 stents a week. So, so how do you balance that? So you can actually make an impact on the acute event death rate, as well as putting the things into place, you know, for chronic care and prevention, you know, which will prevent people from dying from CHF when they're 80 years old. Yeah, um, maybe I'll go first and then David will say something brilliant and my whole mind will be blown. Um, I, it is a real problem. We have to accept that some of those ratios of mortality being worse in the rural hospital will continue to be higher as we move to getting the systems ready to recognize those patients at risk earlier in their diagnosis. Um, and so the key is not how are we going, I think we've been going about it a lot, of like how are we going to staff those critical assets hospitals? How are we going to make sure we can't staff them um, with those people. Now, are we working on things like virtual cath practice so that people get more numbers under their belt for those areas in the meantime? Absolutely. Um, however, I think we have to really be proactive about who is the highest risk before we lose the opportunity. How do we find them, right? But that's, and, and, and we smile, but it's actually doable. With the right systems, we can find the rising risk. And those are the people where you know, if we know you have diabetes, why are you not on a step? Give me a good reason, right? If we know that you have hypertension, have we talked to you and taught your family the symptoms of stroke? The answer is likely no. And so I think those populations, we really need to have an active effort for both patient education and then getting people to get onto guideline directed medical therapy. And you kind of can't do it by just instructing, I think, one person in the primary care rural area after another. We can do a lot of education, but we have to automate some of this. If you're on this dose and you have this diagnosis, unless someone's arguing, you got to go to the next dose. By the way, the doctor or nurse can overlook that and say, hey, no, actually, there's a really good reason. But the majority of times, we're going to have to start opting out of guideline directed therapy rather than opting in to be able to get there. That I kind of, I, I know what you're saying. I'm going to answer you the best I can, and that's what I can do. For stroke, I will change my answer, which is, when I look at those ischemic stroke rates, it reminds me what we've done here in the Northeast. Uh, Lee Schwann was my mentor, and he started Telestroke, and we saved millions of lives and millions of dollars. So I think Telestroke is a little different, but doing an interventional cast, um, we got to catch them and really control them better in that rising risk phase. David, what can I do better? Yeah, I think you covered a lot of that, but I will start out that when you live in a rural area, you make choices regarding quality of life, and you are you go into it, I think, with your eyes wide open, recognizing that I may live in Ely, Minnesota, where I don't have a cardiologist within seven minutes, 
but I like living in Ely, Minnesota, and it contributes to the quality of my life. The other part of it is prevention. And so that's where it gets to the Minnesota community measures. More than 80% of like over 20,000 of our patients who have hypertension are well controlled. We have built processes to make sure they're seen. It doesn't just require the primary care provider. We have pharmacists that are involved in that step therapy that's driven by protocols that goes to that. So the primary thing is prevention, but then you do connect all of the, your local EDs with the mothership to make sure that you have recognition. Because one of the things is someone comes in, we make sure that we can get the enzymes, even in our smallest hospitals, all that forward and get that going. And then design your system the best you can to get to those areas where they can get the intervention. But the most important thing is that prevention and then that recognition. And you have to design your system around that. I think the same thing happens with maternity care. There, there's been 56 hospitals since the 1st of February across the United States that have reduced some sort of care within their hospital. The vast majority of that has been labor and delivery care. Just because you can't provide that quality of care, the science will tell you for fewer than 200 patients, but then how do you design that system to support those people within the small communities without labor and delivery services? So it's really about design, but I think what Amy brought out is you can't leave it to chance. You can't say, just because you live there, you have to take a lower standard of care. Here's the standard of care that we can provide in this community, and we're gonna provide it each and every time reliably, and that requires designing it, staffing it, and requiring the standard work. Thank you. So in many of our um, presentations we've heard in the last two days about the importance of community collaboration, sort of hub structures, bridging organizations like you talked about, David, that are really um, helping to bridge the gap in resources, um, reduce costs by sharing some of the infrastructure and also um, address some of the workforce issues. So I wondered if each of you could talk a little bit about what coordinating, coordinating hub type structures you're seeing in the markets you're in and what recommendations you might have for financing or facilitating future development of that. And any of you can start. I'll jump in. I think the first requirement for any health care provider or any health care system is humility. Uh, when you reach out and you talk with community partners, health care systems, we have a tendency to want to do things our way. Okay, we want to medicalize everything. And the community has a tremendous amount of knowledge. So unless we bring humility to the table, we probably can't come to the solutions that we need to come to. Then what we need to do is to find out at what we've done in our healthcare system, when I came, we were giving money everywhere. If you were the Duluth Community Garden, you could get money from Essentia Health. And I know that gardening is probably good to your health, for your health, but we're not funding those anymore. We have strict criteria that allow us to say, here's the limited amount of resources that we have. Here's what we're gonna fund in these communities because number one, it will have an impact on the health of the community. Number two, it will have an impact on our partners and they'll be able to do better work and that we will learn from it and be able to spread that to further communities. There's a lot of other stuff that we could sit down and talk about, but our challenge was the humility. No, we're essential health, we wanna do it our way. And I think you need to step back from that and have the right people in your organization that are having the conversations with the community partners. Any of our other panelists like to comment? I will um, speak to um, the bridging. So uh, Mary Breckenridge Hospital, which was a small, is a small critical access hospital, was really suffering uh, financially and resource wise. I mentioned that um, things like uh, just the technology, the leadership, all of the things that need to be in place um, in order to run a hospital. And um, it almost failed, but Appalachia Regional Healthcare um, ended up um, taking over Mary Breckridge Hospital. I would say that uh, Frontier Nursing Service sold the hospital to them, but that would be um, 
I, I think I almost was paid to take the hospital. <laughs> but the the bottom line is that um, that happened 10 years ago. And Mary Breckenridge Hospital is still operating in that community. And it's so much stronger. There was so much resistance from the community to allow that to happen uh, because they felt that was their hospital. Um, and uh, as well as the people within the hospital. But that those partnerships are really strong and can be extremely helpful allowing that sharing of those resources such as technology and leadership and all of those things across the system. So um, it's just one small example of the importance of uh, in collaborations if even keeping a small hospital within a community. And I'll just add a little bit so, from that. Oh, go ahead, Ami. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead, Ben. I'll go after you. Yeah, I was just going to add the, you know, from that workforce perspective, I'm blown away at the number of times I'm in committees or, or, or meetings around the healthcare workforce, and there's nobody representing the university systems. There's nobody representing the training institutions in those conversations. And so we've been very deliberate about how do we how do we connect the, the training institutions to the provider organizations in the community to make sure that there is that pipeline and we start developing those relationships early on? Uh, with the Center for Rural Behavioral Health, we were very intentional about finding uh, community-based partners to really support our mission. And we have brought some unusual suspects to the table. We receive uh, funding from ag lending uh, banks, from uh, the Minnesota Pork Association uh, provided funding. And Really what it's about is they all are invested, uh, they're all vested in the outcome of ensuring behavioral health access in those communities. So it, it does really take a convening to, to really bring these resources together, but I think it's paramount to make sure higher education is at the table. I love that, I think that's essential. I think I agree with everyone, so I won't say it again. The only thing I'll add is specifically if we're thinking about systems where we're saying disease management, right? We mentioned hypertension earlier, or I mentioned atrial fibrillation being an area that we worked at, really clearly defining what is the continuum of shared accountability. So I'm not talking so much about the location of care, but who is the person providing the care and what can they do? So if you have a new diagnosis and you need a workup, that should generally be done in the primary care cardiology realm. But if you need rhythm control, which requires a specific set of medications that others may not be as familiar with, that is when we then say you need to see electrophysiology. If your symptoms are mild, you can be here if your symptoms are severe. And we really broke it down into what are all the things that go into this one diagnosis of management over time and where should it live and then get buy-in from both the patients and their caregivers in addition to the clinical caregivers that like this is how our system is gonna work. It's a lot of work. However, once created, it's actually somewhat reproducible because the disease is not that different. You know, there are certain variations you can have, but once you learn where you're gonna go from this variation. So I think a continuum of shared accountability for whatever diagnosis, explaining it, understanding it, educating to it, if it's in community health workers, um, I, I would say that's probably the one other thing about infrastructure that's, that's really important. And we don't think of it as infrastructure, but in fact, that understanding is the infrastructure that helps us and probably why, you know, people like uh, my colleagues here are also successful. So helpful. Team, community members, or committee members, and community members, any additional questions? Larry. You know me, I can't help but ask questions. Um, I actually have two. Uh, one one follow-up for David and one for Amy. My follow-up for David is, of that 40% of your revenue, how much of that's coming from commercial? Other than you mentioned the public uh, funding, but is any of that from commercial? Yes, so a lot of it is from commercial, as a matter of fact, although the vast majority is from uh, public programs, mostly from public programs because they have the data. Insurance companies aren't very good at having data other than claims data. We have a very strong partnership with Medica here in the state of Minnesota and in North Dakota. And we actually share the bottom line on uh, a variety of different uh, programs and services that they provide to employers. So our big challenge has been expanding that within the commercial realm by developing those partnerships with the payers where we call it joint account a joint accountability model, where we're gonna work together, decide 
what each of us is accountable for within this and then work together and then share the bottom line. If we do something and that product that they have loses money, we lose money as well. If we put together a product and it makes money, we all make money together. Uh, I think that's the best way to do, but it requires a lot of different conversations. All of us in our conversations with payers have something in our brainstem from the last 30 years of negotiating with payers that makes it win-lose. And it requires a lot of a CEO's time and a lot of leadership time to call time out, say, well, this is about building relationships and taking care of our patients rather than winning on a particular point. Great, great. Now for you, Amy, um, I could see, I can, I can imagine the remote monitoring for rhythm disturbances um, will lend itself very well to uh, a remote capture. How have you moved beyond that? What what other what are what are your target conditions where you've had success outside of the rhythm space? Yeah, so blood pressure has been another one, which I know primary care has done well um, also, but remote blood pressure monitoring. Um, we've also been doing remote cholesterol monitoring. So those blood pressure programs that I'm talking about, we started really thinking about how do we, um, we are starting a driving urgency for LDL screening um, throughout the country which is a real large now funded play to get everybody to at least get that done. Now, whether or not you think an LDL is the cure all to you know, preventing cardiovascular disease is not on the table right now. It's simply that we need to be checking something. So we're gonna take the, um, the, the base. And so uh, hypertension is a very well established one. Heart failure has pockets because heart failure requires a real hub and spoke model with heart failure docs. Uh, present there. However, heart failure preserved ejection fraction. These are people who have the heart failure symptoms but actually don't have weak heart muscle. That is probably the next area that we can grow out of um, for remote monitoring based on what we're learning from hypertension, what we're learning based on weight scales. Um, similar to what David said, though, I'll say two things. So ASEB, heart failure, hypertension, and cholesterol screening, main areas of interest for us. As we're working on that, one of the things we're doing from the innovation side, I'm just gonna put that hat on for a second, is really partnering with the monitoring companies that we think are doing it right, that are willing to work with us to fit into the existing workflow or make a reasonable workflow for clinicians and teams to be able to use them. Um, and so to really similar to what David was saying, be there at the table with them and say, you know, our name is with you, your success is with us. Um, we have a, a small LLC that actually puts in minimal actually amount of dollars because we are a nonprofit, but some dollars and invest in some of those companies saying, we, we really believe your success is gonna be our clinicians and patients' success. Um, and so I think you do need to show these remote monitoring tech companies, we can't have a million of you. We're gonna need to narrow down the ones who can achieve success are the ones who are gonna be willing to, to work with the clinicians um, rather than saying our square peg, your round hole, but let's develop it together. So. Um, hopefully there will be more things, but AFib, heart failure, um, hypertension right now, and moving towards LDL screening. David, I see you have your hand raised. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, uh, Amy put a question in the chat that said, this is great, but culture change is hard. How long before the progression to value-based care did the messaging start? Uh, I believe the culture change is the only thing that you makes this work because culture is what's very durable in your organization. That's what makes it so hard to change. Uh, Ed Shine, who wrote the book on you know, corporate or organizational culture was a good friend of mine. And what he used to say is that culture is the behaviors that are successful within an organization. So it's not what you say your culture is, it's what someone can come in and observe. These are the behaviors that are successful. So what we did is we said, okay, we're gonna make sure that these behaviors are successful in our organization. We're gonna design our organization around those behaviors that align with value-based care. We're gonna reward people that do that by just attention and thank yous. Uh, we had someone that raised their hand at one of our leadership things that says, you know, why do we fire somebody in this organization that has 200 outstanding charts and we don't do anything for the person that has 200 patients that should be on a statin that aren't? And it really changed the culture of our organization. You have to measure and reinforce and support the right behaviors. And then that will change the culture. And then that will make it very durable. 
that keeps people from tipping you off this value-based care journey, sometimes when it's very difficult and sometimes when it just is a very hard thing to do with the patient that sits across from you. That's great. I love hearing that because as we really start thinking about quality measures, accreditation based on quality measures, centers of excellence for diseases, we're basing it all on we're going to do the same quality no matter how you're getting paid right now. And then we will hope that, that culture will change enough from fee for service. I mean, we have so many procedures that <laughs> there are, you know, parts of cardiovascular care that are more preventive and those people will get on value-based care. And then there are those who, you know, got into it to do procedures and, and are, are paid for them. And um, I understand where they come from. Their, their mortgage and their kids' college depends on that. But uh, I think I think we can get there in a way where everybody is, is focused on it. Thanks, David. I'm going to um, shift to a really um, heady question. <laughs> so, um, David, um, we have a question for you. If, if single-sided risk and or double-sided risk is a realistic goal for the typical rural provider, and what would the glide path be in order to prepare and encourage more rural providers to participate in APMs and accept risk? So the first question I would ask is that, does it require accepting risk to change behavior? Because what you're talking about really is changing behavior and you're using risk, either single-sided or double-sided risk as an incentive to change that behavior. So I would ask the question, what are the behaviors that you really wanna change and what is the best way to do that? Uh, we are happy to take upside and downside risk because we've made the commitment and built the infrastructure to support it. and. We like taking that risk because we do well in it. It spurs our quality and we go on. There may be other providers, as was mentioned, they may not have the numbers. They may not, you know, one patient can tip a small practice from being very successful to being regarded as a failure in a particular statistic. So what I would say is what mechanisms, what toolkit of mechanisms can we have that incent the right behaviors in a particular practice? I think we've heard from every one of us today that what we've said is, you know, a standard is possible, but as unique as necessary. You can certainly, there aren't an infinite number of classifications of rural health care providers, but there's certainly enough to say, how do we incent the behaviors that we want in a particular practice so their patients get better care and that that practice is sustainable? And I don't know if that's the answer to your question or not, but that's my philosophy on it. Great, very, very helpful. Any other advice about the glide path to get there? I would say you have to measure the glide path. And we actually use the term glide path for every one of our quality measures within our organization. So you can pull up the dashboard and using hypertension as an example. And if we're not making it, we have you know 124 people that are not meeting their goal on hypertension. The key to it is to start to measure within your practice, making the, the outcomes of your patients and making the processes that you have within your practice to get those outcomes transparent is the best way to start. It is very challenging for small practices to build that level of analytics. I think there, there could be a toolkit that you could put and have a lot of different practices share rather than have them to develop it on their own. But until you get that transparency, agreement on what your goals are, and the transparency of where you are on the journey, I think you're not planning for success, you're just hoping for success. Thank you, David. So maybe Jim, I'm please. just gonna add to that for one second, if it's okay. We have a, a atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk score, ASCVD risk score, it's based on blood pressure, LDL, et cetera. Um, and we've created in a way that in most people's electronic health records, um, one can actually just have those fields pulled, and it'll give you the percent likelihood that your patient will have a heart attack in the next 10 years, which is what we use to determine taking a statin. But we can also use it now to say, but if your blood pressure comes down this much, then this risk will go down. If your LDL comes down this much, and so we started to use it more as a teaching tool for the patient. Dietitians, nutritionists can use it as well. Our pharmacists are using it. Um, and so I think those kind of tools are helpful to people eventually once we roll out those tools, though, I think what David's saying is right. The next step needs to be, now you know how to use the tool, and now we are going to measure our use of the tool. Um, that's still scary for clinicians, but I think it has to be that next step. 
And what we do every year is we, at the end of the year, we translate into actual lives saved. So if we, if we are at, you know, 85% on colon cancer screening, that translates to this many lives saved. Hypertension, uh, statins, all the other stuff, that, you know, breast cancer screening, mammograms, we transfer that, we translate that to lives saved. And I think that really helps us get alignment within the organization that our mission is we are called to make a healthy difference in people's lives. And this is the healthy difference. These are the people that will, you know, see their grandchildren's graduation or their daughter getting married and really translate that into impacts on lives rather than statistics on a dashboard. So helpful. Um, we're right at time for our public comment, but Jim, do you have a fast question or? Okay. We want to thank our, our presenters so much. This was really valuable dialogue and just encourage you to stay on if you'd like to continue to hear the conversation today. So we do have a public comment. Um, there's one person that signed up to give public comment and I want to open it up to Elizabeth Foster from Columbia Gorge Coordinated Care Organiz Organization in Oregon CCO. And Elizabeth, please go ahead. Oh, can you hear me? Okay. We can hear you perfectly. Excellent. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Elizabeth Foster and I'm a rural family physician and a founding member of the Columbia Gorge Health Council, the public partner of our rural coordinated care organization. We are addressing rural health disparities with community health workers. We need payment reform to support clinically effective cost saving care to address health disparities in rural parts of Oregon. Community health workers, CHWs, are system navigators, health educators, patient advocates. They connect patients with resources and services. They help patients and family members understand and advocate for their own health care needs. Often bilingual and bicultural, CHWs are trusted to provide patient centered care for racially and culturally diverse patients and families. Oregon has a long history of incorporating CHWs in clinical and community settings since the late 1980s, targeting diabetes education, migrant farm worker outreach, perinatal care, access to housing, and now support for frail older adults. Clinic-based community health workers. Connected Care for Older Adults is a pilot that uses community health workers and evidence-based age-friendly protocols to provide improved care for frail older adults in rural areas. Currently being tested in the Columbia River Gorge, the clinic-based pilot is conservatively projected to result in a return on investment of 5.15 over three years. Our community-based CHW program has also demonstrated medical cost savings. Community health workers provide effective interventions that save public funds, reduce health care costs, decrease hospital days, increase use of primary care and behavioral health services, provide fragile older adults with access to resources, improve patient and clinician satisfaction, and save money. The projected return of investment on the connected care for older adults CHW pilot is over five times in three years. Problem, community health worker services are not currently reimbursed at viable rates or at all. Current billing mechanisms do not support community health worker travel, home visits, coordination of care, outreach, connecting patients with community services, et cetera. They're currently funded through unsustainable, unstable grant cycles and local investment. Solution, add a wrap payment to cover CHW services at FQHCs, RHCs, and community-based hubs. Wrap payments are used for cost-based reimbursement for RHCs and FQHCs. They cover actual costs and are paid as a block fee to cover the differences between Medicare and Medicaid payments and actual costs of visits. Because the scope and breadth of care our community health worker performs varies a lot and much of the work is not done in the visit, the wrap payment could be tied to panel size, PMPM payments, with expectations that delivery of evidence-based services are available to those who are, who are impaneled and capitated. Number two, currently private insurers are not required to pay for CHWs as essential services. Action, require private insurers to cover CHW services. We're, we are available to share our evidence-based program and cost savings information with you. Thank you for your time.
Thank you so much, Dr. Foster. Amy, are there any other um, public commenters? Hey, uh, hearing none, this is the end of the public comments. And now the committee members and I are going to discuss what we've learned yesterday and today from our guest presenters, panel discussions, and background materials. PTAC will submit a report to the Secretary of HHS with our comments and recommendations based on the public meeting. Members, you have a document on potential topics of discussion and deliberation tucked into your binder to help guide the conversation. If you have a comment or question, please flip your name tent up or raise your hand in WebEx. And we'll be discussing this until about 12.50. Who would like to start? All right, I'll make it easy, Lauren. I'll start since nobody wants to start. You, I started Jay. yesterday. I'll, st I'll start today. Uh, you know, another great set of panels. I, I think, again, you know, kind of re reiterating yesterday about the ecosystem between, you know, hospitals and primary care. I think it, it got sharper in focus today with some of our presenters in terms of the hospital. The emergency department, often sometimes they're staffed by different organizations. They're not hospital employees. A lot of ED staffing is outsourced to private enterprises. They all have to be aligned for rural health care, from my perspective, for survival. In addition, whatever payment methodologies and alternative payment models and total cost, it really does have to be across all payers. Because the Medicare population or the Medicaid population alone is not enough to su to support them on an ongoing basis. So we really have to be cognizant of that. You know, we can talk about upfront costs, upfront costs, all we want, but where are the cost, where are those dollars going to, where the where's the money going to come from? And you, it's not just enough for CMS. We, this needs to happen at the state level and the local level. You know, everybody's got to come together if we're really serious, you know, as Jim alluded to yesterday, we need a moonshot if we're really going to have make an impact on rural health care. So helpful. Thank you, Jay. So what I'd like to do is go around the room and just capture what additional insights or things um, should we emphasize or call out as a result of this meeting? Lee, would you kick us off? Thank you. Yeah, it's all still um, gelling, I think, but um, I was really struck by um, many of David's comments about Ascension and how they are you know, pretty deeply connected to their community and, and doing deep learning about what the community needs to truly be effective and change health metrics, but then not, but then being very specific in building a culture where doing, as he said several times, doing the you know, the right thing to do is the easy thing to do. So he's, he's building the systems that, that deliver that outcome reliably, um, which was fairly striking. A lot of times I think in, in standard practice, it's, it's um, more haphazard that the right thing happens to do when all the forces align randomly and we can't count on that moving forward. Um, so I was struck by the, the statement that uh, until you have transparency of data and concrete action you're just open for you're just open for success not planning for success and i think that can be applied to a wide variety of uh, learnings from this meeting that's great thank you jenny building on um great day building on some of the themes from yesterday uh, what i have written down is something that was said in this panel which standard is possible unique is necessary and so I do think going back to rural archetypes and how we differentiate and create both standardization and some level of uniqueness is important. Um, I was struck by something that Tom Lee said, which is, you know, one of the things that is necessary in implementation is unwinding of time to find more time to play offensively, to play offense, I'm sorry, play offense. And so I think that 
um, you know, it's really important to look at how the time expectations of the primary care physician um, and other providers is handled in reimbursement that is important. And from today, one of the things that struck me across the board was the importance, and, and I think this has been said many times before, of data and data infrastructure and the ability to risk stratify on the front end. While this is important, I think everywhere in value-based care, it seems to be um, the largest opportunity and gap that exists in rural areas that they don't have the tools and enablement in order to be able to actually actualize even the basics, right? And so that's very important. Um, and so that struck me as a theme from today was really across the board, um, you know, how do we get that resource proactively so people can actually start the process. And um, lastly, from our public commenter, I wanted to sort of also double click on, you know, paying for at having sort of, you know, having private insurers as well as, as um, CMS pay for wraparound payments for CHWs, but also all allied health professionals in a way that I think that's the challenge is to do that in a way to maintain budget neutrality, but really figure out how that team based payment can work. So we bring, so it behooves people to actually bring those allied professionals under the tent. Very helpful, Jenny. Lindsay. Yeah, thanks for the conversation. Yeah, I mean, I think the theme that came through almost every presentation is that it's, it's hard to think about cost savings as we think about uh, applying that lens to rural providers and hospitals when right now financial viability uh, or existence is, is the primary concern. I think a couple themes resonate. Um, whether it's a proposal for a hub and spoke model or using AHCs to provide support to rural areas or rural hospitals, figuring out a way we leverage resources and don't expect rural hospitals and providers to get out of this on their own needs to be part of the solution. Um, we heard the theme of upright, upfront front funds on multiple occasions, but I, I also found today the concept of you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be more money, but what do we pay rural hospitals to do? And if we provide stable funding to do different things, could we influence the problem of volume needing to drive uh, sustainability? I heard, we heard again today the need for all payer alignment. And, and I think even some tinges of where can where can state involvement in terms of promoting the amount of primary care spend or aligning on quality measures for state problem pro programs? How could that also decrease some of that administrative burden that our, our rural providers feel intensely? Um, a couple of themes around flexibility. I think I heard that flexibility for home-based or alternative sites of care can be especially important for rural communities. Um, and flexibility in telehealth space, particularly in things like hospice care or other at-risk models. If we're paying you for outcomes, let's not worry as much about how you are delivering that or where you are delivering that. And then the last thing that Chinny highlighted is, you know, what are con those compensable actions that don't require a clinical license that drive value either on non-medical drivers of health or improving health-related social needs? Where are those people, whether they be community health workers um, or, or actions that we would expect a rural provider to, um, to have for our patients that currently don't have a way to get reimbursed and that cost plus reimbursement isn't enough uh, to, to, to be able to make those people um, uh, exist in communities. I'll end there. Thank you, Lindsay. Walter. Um, first, I just wanted to thank the hard work of the PCDT, um, ASV, North staff for just another outstanding public session. It's, it's been uh, really informative. And as I've 
listened through uh, these past two days of um, superb experts uh, kind of sharing their, their insights and wisdom, I was reminded of the famous opening line of a Charles Dickens novel. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times, it was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness, it was the epoch of belief, it was the epoch of incredulity. And I, I really do think we have a tale of two health systems uh, in America, one uh, urban, which we're so familiar with, and one that's uh, often not so much in the um, news and the limelight, the, the rural health system. And in many ways, these uh, two health systems are uh, quite unique and, and um, face different issues. I um, ended my comment yesterday um, with the idea that I think the task before us as a committee is to help um, suggest or recommend a payment model redesign to support innovation in team-based care delivery models tailored to rural health. Um, and just to kind of dissect that a bit further, you know, I, 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 this idea of um, team-based delivery models tailored to rural health is something that I think um, I'm all the more convinced is, is important uh, after our experts today. Uh, the idea that maybe we can address some of the shortages of resources in rural health um, through telehealth uh, that uh, leverages more intensive primary care to decrease the, the need for specialist care. Um, the, uh, idea that we can use non-licensed healthcare workers to leverage the um, uh, presence of primary care resources in rural America, I think, is really fascinating. Um, and maybe through kind of the um, better utilization of non-healthcare resources or primary care resources, we can create more specialist uh, capacity, more primary care capacity, and address some of the problems um, that we've heard about these past couple of days. So this whole idea of innovating care delivery models, I, I think is uh, important. Um, and um, I really appreciated also the comment of Dr. Foster uh, around the community health workers. I think it speaks to that concept of um, creating more effective uh, FTEs uh, of licensed professionals through the use of team-based care. Um, and I uh, hope that's something that we can um, encourage CMMI to explore. Thank you, Walter. Larry. We heard a lot of common themes. Uh, we certainly, I think uh, Alana said it well that finance drives function. And we need to prioritize, if we want value-based care, we have to pay for value-based care. We have to figure out a way of doing it. One of the other comments she made that stuck with me and I wrote down is that the providers are suffering innovation fatigue. And I think it stems from the fact that we haven't done the moonshot. As Jim mentioned yesterday, we've been tweaking and tweaking and tweaking around the edges and the, the providers are tired of it. And I think we need to tighten our timelines. We need to be bolder in what we're doing because the tweaking is just gonna continue to alienate them. We, this committee, has come up with a model. And, and we said earlier, we reported to the secretary last year that the model should be high touch proactive care, team based high touch proactive care. Well, if that's the model, then let's, let's push it and figure out how it should be paid for. Uh, I think our provider entities are screaming for it and they're, they're waiting for us to act. Um, this goes to the heart of why this committee exists. This, this committee exists to allow the groundswell of innovation from the provider community to actually reach an implementable crescendo. 
I think we're seeing then that somebody needs to take it over the other other side before the wrong entities prevail in the market. If we want the right things done, we have to be bold and push the right things. Um, and those are my takeaways from today and yesterday. Thank you, Larry, Jim. I would prefer not to have to follow that. That was brilliant. Um, I, 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 number one, I'm, I feel privileged to be here to, um, for the last uh, six or nine months sitting at the committee and learning so much about how this, how this works. Um, and I'm really grateful that there was a theme that was decided to listen around rural health care providers and their participation in total cost of care value-based arrangements. And I really appreciate the fact that citizens get a chance to, you know, both talk at um, from their homes and then people like us get to come here and to hang out with people that are dedicated their lives, the staff, to dedicate their lives, their careers to doing something that really can promote um, scale. Um, when we asked our, when we've asked ourselves this question about rural health providers, we are then as providers, if you will, representing what we think we heard from our colleagues. And one of the things that I take away from our meeting, uh, in addition to what you're saying, Larry, is the sense of urgency, but that that I, I, I got an impression that I think can be proven with a little bit more research, that there's probably unintended, unmeasured health disparities existing in rural America because of value-based care. And it may be getting worse. I feel like that's what I heard from the SMEs. And I think that's the subtext is they're feeling something from the patients and they're feeling something about themselves. They're feeling something about their infrastructure and the perceived threat. And, and Larry, I think you're spot on is that there are market forces that are more than willing to respond to that vulnerability. And, and so, so it, as a consequence, I, I think what I, um, in addition to what everybody brilliantly said, I think one of the things that we've not explored um, well enough is this idea that there are agencies and departments in the government who are who have funding and people and talent and programs that touch health and healthcare, and they could be arrayed and coordinated in a way to help the providers on the front line in rural America and help the help them help the patients and their families to reduce the um, inequality that exists in the United States. And as we said yesterday, this is a bipartisan opportunity uh, because it speaks to the very heart. It's some, oftentimes we talk about the rural areas of the heartland of our country. And someone, one of our speakers yesterday said food, fiber, and fuel. You know, these, this is the bedrock of our country. And, um, and oftentimes, you know, in rural America, we, we can see some of the, I think we can see some of the issues that they confront often like we would see a, a developing country or a country who's challenged, a whole nation that's challenged. And it's quite possible that we could actually approach the problem in rural America as you might approach a developing country's problem of developing their infrastructure and, and developing their human capital and their economic development. And I think that that plays to both the red and the blue in us, you know, or the Americanness in us, right? That we're, that we're all Americans and we all are very, very deeply concerned if, if there are both providers and patients experiencing avoidable morbidity and mortality as, a, as an unintended consequence of a well-meaning 
model or policy. And so I would call us to think through this idea of can we organize in a way, can we PTAC recommend something that's you that's unique that we would organize or um, agencies and departments who whose activities can be identified and can be said that's a health related activity that deals with labor and the need for behavioral health workers, our community health workers. There's a communication and infrastructure area or transportation or food or public health or payment, you know, us, um, Medicaid and Medicare payments and, and of course, antitrust. <laughs> we, we know about consolidation. So I think there's this opportunity for us as a committee to report and ask for the secretary to consider a, a project that would kind of reimagine kind of how we would help our rural providers and their patients by arraying the entire federal structure that we have that touches health. Um, so I'll leave it there. Thank you, Jim and Jen. I too want to give my gratitude uh, to the numerous people who contributed uh, to making this uh, really exceptional, uh, valuable last two days. Uh, there were four things that, um, in addition to all the previous comments and our comments yesterday, uh, that, that I heard that I'd like to note. Uh, the first is that um, moving from volume to value has no place uh, in our rural community uh, construct when we think about uh, our value-based care delivery models and payment models. It, it just doesn't work. Um, we heard a lot around, you know, the, the challenge around low volume, uh, and I'm convinced after these last two days that just aggregation of uh, patients for attribution um, or uh, being able to apply risk methodology uh, is uh, the, the wrong approach. Uh, and what we heard is, um, or our question was asked that I thought was a really important and thought-provoking one, is risk necessary to change behaviors? Uh, and I think the answer in this situation, again, after these two days, I, I think the answer is no. Um, what we heard is uh, that, you know, financial viability is the number one success factor. And so thinking about how to create a sustainable workforce and delivery network that touches um, our rural patients uh, and uh, props up our uh, delivery system providers, uh, including our um, various forms of acute care hospitals, seems uh, important. It's part of critical infrastructure. And when our rural providers are already uh, in a practice environment that is by nature at risk, delivering care to our vulnerable patients who are not healthy, um, not only is it a, a, a call to us um, around the fragility and the fact that it's breaking, but uh, it, it, I think we need to be laser focused on how to uh, create uh, maintenance and sustainability. Um, because I think point number two, uh, what I heard early on in the session yesterday, um, and then again today, I think we all agree that the first principle is to be home first, which means community uh, first. And in order to do that, there's a cost of availability, um, much like our utilities that we've talked about before. Uh, and I thought lots of good conversation that I won't replicate here, but we heard that most of the cost uh, of, from a delivery perspective is fixed uh, in our, these communities. And so really we need to pivot our thinking around leveraging this fixed cost to be more effective and to be more efficient. And we have these payment structures uh, that it sounds like are preventing us from being able, uh, being able to do that and, and leverage some of those assets that are already in those communities. The last thing I heard dovetails on what I think Jim is raising and that's um, I think it's become clear we, we have to double down on pu public private partnerships uh, and that in these communities, conveners are really uh, critical. Um, if that's from portfolio management and seeking funding and implementing funding through grants, 
um, or operationally, you know, project managing ha had to do that implementation. There's n there's a need for that um, within you know, at least the provider community. So my last point is, uh, it, it sounds to me like a community-based ACO program, um, which CMMI has already you know, started thinking about and, and implementing, but I think really getting sophisticated and understanding what a community-based ACO looks like with regards to funding and unique partnerships, with regards to this idea of fixed cost and utilities, with regards to unique, um, I'm, I don't even think, community health workers are no longer innovative. They're critical infrastructure. So there might be an innovative care model, um, but that asset is one that's that's no longer innovative. Uh, and there's a real opportunity for us to think about how to keep care at home and when appropriate an escalation to an interventional cardiologist, not in the acute care phase, but right in the diagnostic phase. But what are those things that um, can be kept closer to home uh, with uh, the resources that uh, exist? Thank you. Thank you so much, Jen. Angelo. Yeah, so thank you. So uh, again, just like everybody else, I'll start out by commending the uh, this, this team, the PTAC committees, and all of our support uh, from Aspie and Nork and others that have participated in this, and particularly to our panelists who clearly dedicated a lot of time to putting their presentations together, have years of experience that they've brought to the table. And a lot of their discussion, I think, has been eye-opening to me, and I suspect a lot of people around the table. Um, we had a good discussion yesterday after yesterday's meetings, and I just want to kind of rapidly highlight a couple of those that you know, what we heard is uh, lack of capital investment. We heard a lack of community resources and a lack of ability to partnership or organize those community resources. Uh, we heard a lack of definition of rural and the recognition of the different archetypes of rural. Um, we uh, heard that VBC just doesn't work in the rural community. We heard that uh, qual the quality measure dysfunction that we experience even in the urban areas is magnified in the, in the rural areas. Uh, we heard the, the lack of data. Uh, and we heard that this is a public emergency. And so, and we talk about it only being 15%, it's 15%. It's 15% of all the people in the United States of which no other area has the capacity to absorb those 15%. And so I just wanna emphasize those things. And what it really says to me is that the rural components emphasizes the fact that we don't really have a healthcare system. We still have fragmented care, fragmented programs, et cetera. And so I am looking forward to that day when we actually can develop a system where maybe maybe we need a rural ACO, but wouldn't it be nice if we had a healthcare system that alleviated the need to have a rural ACO, that, that actually all the systems were integrated that the, uh, we supported the rural hospitals, connected them to the urban and academic medical centers, that the specialists in those areas were connected to, to the rural primary care uh, physicians and, and specialists, um, and, and that we, you know, we work to create true integration. And that's what we talk about. We have a model that we've talked about as the model what we've not talked about is how does that get operationalized and integrated across all geographies uh, in the United States? And I think that's where we need uh, a thought process around. And the last thing I'll mention is, you know, even in my previous work, going back to what a lot of what Jim talked about, there's a huge amount of resources in state agencies and governor cabinet uh, resources. That, that deal with healthcare day in and day out. And those things are not coordinated with all the other healthcare resources that are, that are available in the healthcare system, and they should be. And so lots of opportunity, all this is fixable. Somebody's gotta step up and make a decision that we're gonna pull all this together, so. Thank you so much, Angelo. Audrey or any of the staff have any questions or comments? 
I want to thank all of our esteemed presenters and also our wonderful experts on the committee itself for your active engagement, really important comments and really key themes. We've explored a lot of facets regarding and encouraging rural provider participation in population-based total cost of care models. And I think we will continue to gather information on our theme through a request for input on our topic. We'll be posting that on the ASPE PTAC website and sending it out through the PTAC listserv. You can offer your input on our questions by October 20th. The committee will work to issue a report to the secretary with our recommendations from this public meeting. And with that, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Produced by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services.